I was sitting in my office, minding my own business one day about two years ago, when a man called from an organization doing a survey about the readability of the King James Bible. The caller did not say who was really behind the survey. My impression of this organization's name was that they were trying to show how the King James Bible was readable. The caller asked if I had a few minutes to participate in an anonymous survey. For once, I did not have anything pressing right then, so I said that, yes, I could participate in the survey. The caller asked if I was King James only. In my experience, that can mean different things to different people, so I said that I only use the King James. Then I was asked about my educational background, which I told the interviewer about. I was also instructed that I could answer I don't know to any question, which I would later realize would only help the survey of the survey architect get the results he was looking for. I was pastor number 92 out of 99 interviewed. Now it was time for the survey questions. The first 10 questions were about determining singular or plural from some Bible verses. I thought to myself, well, this should be easy. I'll just use the rule that I learned in Bible college about the Y pronouns being plural and the T pronouns being singular. As the questions went along, there was one singular, but the rest were plural. I started to second guess myself thinking, there shouldn't be this many plurals, should there? Now, the way the questions were arranged was really disingenuous. In a teacher's test and measurements class, you would learn that a test should have a general representation of the different principles or issues involved so you can see if a student understands all of the material. That would mean a teacher should make a test with five plural and five singular or maybe six versus four to see if someone understands not one singular and nine plural. Because of this way of questioning, the survey doesn't give real world results. Later on, learn the author is Mark Ward, and I believe he purposely chose to put nine plural you questions in because they're harder to determine than the these or thous. But Ward was more deceptive than that. He selected passages where the general context made it seem like it was singular when the you was actually plural. So these 10 questions are not representative of average Bible usage, making the stated purpose of the survey deceptive. The results of this half of the survey were released by Ward about a year ago, and most of the 100 pastors surveyed did poorly. I got all 10 correct because I followed the simple rule, so it seems as if the majority of the other pastors forgot. Now, Ward concludes from this part of the survey that we should stop using the King James and pick nearly any other version, since people aren't using the very consistent ye, the rule. But this is also deceptive. Think about it. If people are struggling to determine singular and plural with a consistent rule that allows you to precisely know if the words are singular or plural, how does it help to go to a version that does away with the precision? Ward's conclusion is that since people did poorly, we should abandon the clear tools and move to the murky modern versions. Wouldn't a better answer be to remind people of the rule so that they could get them all right? A more scientific study would have had a control group for the same pa uh, passages in a modern version where you, to define the singular and plural and then tell them the rule and see how they would do with the King James. That would reveal real-world readability of both the King James and a modern one, but Ward doesn't do that. So this survey about supposed readability only reveals the forgettability of the singular plural rule of the King James. The best solution is to consistently teach and remind people of the rule instead of discarding the accurate and clear King James Bible version. The second half of the readability survey involved 10 questions where the interviewer read a single verse and then asked me to define a word or a short phrase, making this survey more about definability. Ward created this Faith King James Readability Organization to quiz pastors on the definition of 10 short phrases or words. But keep in mind, most people don't approach the Bible grammatically, and people can even have a general sense of a passage without being able to precisely define every word in a passage. So as the questions are going along, I'm answering them, but I'm wondering, why are they using these mostly obscure passages? 
The theme between the questions seem to be phrases with a King James rendering would be differently perceived today than when it was originally translated. Nearly all the phrases were ones that I had studied in the past in their context and understood them. Then we got to question number four in the second section, and the verse was, how long halt ye between two opinions? What does halt mean? And in that moment, after the interviewer asked that question, I knew who was behind the survey, what purpose he was trying to accomplish, and what the general results of the survey would be. Here's how I knew. A few months before the survey, I had seen a Facebook post about a Jacksonville, Florida pastor named Brian Sams. He was giving a seminar for a conference sponsored by a pastor's Facebook group called the Ideas Network that was led by Pastor Josh Tice. Brian Sams' workshop was about how to transition a fundamental King James-using church to one using a modern version. After a little more research, I discovered that Sam had been influenced by Mark Ward. So, who is Mark Ward? Well, it turns out he's the guy that made snarky videos bashing the King James and condescendingly encouraging people to switch to modern versions. In one of his videos, he dresses up as a game show host to quiz people over what Ward calls false friends. And one of those verses was, How long halt ye? Now, Mark grew up in a good independent Baptist church in Virginia, but went to Bob Jones University to get a Bible degree. Here, he was indoctrinated with secular higher criticism by faculty who contributed to the pro-higher criticism book, From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man. This book undermines the verbal inerrancy of God's Word, even as the title described. Ward finished his studies at Bob Jones University with a Ph.D. in Bible and a purpose of converting King James using pastors to use other Bible versions. And here he was fathering me. So, in the end, the organization for the readability of the King James Bible was really a deceptive lie instead of just saying, oh, it's just a volunteer reading Mark Ward's script in the survey. Now, after realizing what was really going on, I was very reluctant to answer any questions I wasn't really sure about. So, in the end, I didn't answer three questions, and I got one wrong, at least according to Mark. Now, even with all of that, I got a good test score compared to the rest of the other hundred pastors. But also in that moment, I knew what the general result of the survey was going to be. Pastors would miss enough questions that Ward could then turn around and say, see, if pastors miss questions, then we need to get rid of the archaic King James Version and replace it with a modern version. Now, I knew this because Mark Ward's videos are as formulaic as a Hallmark movie. First, he introduces a challenging King James phrase, then he hatchets and bludgeons the King James, then he condescendingly promotes modern versions in a way that would make the emperor who wore no clothes very proud. Then he talks about how much he loves the King James. Mr. Ward, I hope you don't love your wife the way you love the King James Bible, because that's not love. Stop saying you love the King James when you really don't. Instead, just be honest and say that you appreciate a few of the features of the King James, but you really love the ESV. Then, Mark finishes his typical video with a warning about tribalism. This is a deceitful way of torching the King James and then discouraging King James users from calling the fire department. He is deceitful about this because nothing destroys unity in a King James using church more than someone indoctrinating pastors to change their philosophy, position, and practice on the King James. If you want to promote peace, then leave us alone so that we can go back to winning souls and preaching God's Word. In the end, even though I scored well, the survey, I don't think, is really very relevant as evidence of much except for Mark Ward's deception. Now, let's get into what are the real issues. Did this survey persuade me? What are the real issues involved? That was really the purpose of Mark Ward's survey. There's something that I believe called the hierarchy of values. This means that no one believes all truths equally. Some truths have to have higher value than others. This is why some groups, religious groups, will choose their experience over God's Word. They value the experience is more important. I realized before completing Mark Ward's test, masquerading as a survey, that his real purpose was to sway me to use modern versions of the Bible. 
But I don't use the King James Version of the Bible because it's the easiest to read in the first place. To me, there is something that is more foundational than the Bible versions, and it's the underlying texts. A Greek or Hebrew text is a compilation of ancient manuscripts, and there are two main Greek text families. The text underlying the King James is the majority text, which is based on thousands of ancient manuscripts used in Bible-believing churches. The critical text underlying the modern versions is primarily based on two ancient manuscripts which disagree with themselves and were not used in Bible-believing churches and were found in dubious situations. So which is more important to you, readability or reliability? Let's say you had no car and someone offered to give you one of two free cars to use exclusively. Car number one is an old classic that runs well and is in good shape, but it doesn't have modern features. Car number two is brand new and has features like interlock brakes, electric windows and locks, Bluetooth media player, but it has reliability issues where on average, 5% of the time, it won't start. You'll just get stranded. So that's one in 20 times it won't start on average. Which one would you choose? In this case, I would choose the old reliable so that I could get where I needed to go every time. Now the difference between the two families of New Testament texts is about 5%. And while that may not sound like very much, the result of being stranded in life by wrong doctrine could be the difference between heaven or hell not being stuck in a supermarket parking lot. I also don't believe the modern versions are really more readable. For the King James, the arrangement of the words is a little simpler, but some words and phrases are less familiar. But even if the King James is easier to read, that's not really the most important issue. Mark Ward is, again, being deceitful by arguing for people to change Bible versions based on practical reasons like readability when he believes in the other versions because of philosophical reasons, like the belief that the oldest two manuscripts are more reliable than the thousands of younger manuscripts. He believes this in spite of the fact that it's unclear how we know exactly for sure how old they really are. For more details on this, see David Sorensen's book, Neither Oldest Nor Best. So, Mark Ward failed to convince me because he never dealt with the issue of manuscript reliability in his survey, and I believe that's even more important. Even in his other materials, <clears throat> He doesn't deal with the manuscript reliable issue very much. Why does that matter? Manuscript reliability is a watershed issue that underpins other doctrines. The rare time Ward talks about the reliability, he deceptively says that the differences between the majority text and the critical text basically do not matter. But 15 whole verses are missing in the modern versions. Plus, more, there are more verses missing significant parts of a verse, including the foundation of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6.13. Because of his wrong manuscript belief, Ward believes these verses were added to the underlying King James Version manuscripts. But there's a third part. What about Mark 16, verses 9 through 20? This passage deals with the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, plus the Great Commission. So it is critical to foundational doctrines. It's included, though, in modern translations, even though these verses are missing in the two primary oldest is best manuscripts. So, if the best manuscripts do not include the dozen verses from Mark 16, then why would they be added in the modern version English, or in the modern English version Bibles? Wouldn't this be a direct violation of the book of Revelation's warning of adding to Scripture. So either the verses are correct in the majority text and should remain, or they were wrong to be included and should be discarded. But it is deceitful to both include the missing verses and then add a footnote saying they shouldn't be here. But there's also a subtle undermining of the authority of God's Word that is at play. Ward has traded the textual accuracy of 1 Peter 1.25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever, instead for his textual confidence. 
Textual confidence sounds to me like it's where someone is pretty sure the Bible is pretty much all there instead of just believing God has accurately preserved his word. Let's consider now lessons that we can learn from this whole situation. The first is the spirit of error. There's a greater issue at the heart of this debate than even the underlying New Testament or Old Testament text issues, and that is a spirit of error. Of the 21 demonic spirits mentioned by name in the Bible, nearly one quarter of them deal with false doctrine or false religion. That's why the Apostle Paul, in the context of false prophets in the church in 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 through 14, warns that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Yes, Satan can influence believers to believe and promote false doctrine as Peter did in Matthew 16, 21 to 23. But once someone allows the spirit of error to work, it will continue to work in more areas unless that person repents. That is why a little bit of unbelief does not ever lead to true belief. It only leads to more unbelief. This doctrine about God's word is a watershed issue. A little difference in raindrops on either side of the continental divide leads to a final de destination of different oceans, and this is why churches that change their Bible version will or have already changed other things of faith and practice to accommodate this wrong spirit. So my purpose in this video is to warn about this false doctrine by Mark Ward, Brian Sands, and others. God's plan for false doctrine is warning and separation. So should we warn? Paul publicly confronted Peter about wrong doctrine and practice in Galatians 2, 11 to 14. Paul warned night and day with tears in the book of Acts chapter 20. Paul even warned the leaders of the Ephesian church to watch out for false teachers from their own congregation in Acts 20 and verse 30. And then he mentions more false teachers specifically by name. But warning has another purpose. It shows where people stand by whom they warn against. Paul warned against false teachers and doctrine, while Mark Ward warns against people using the King James and tribalism. I believe tribalism is just Mark Ward's code word to fight against biblical separation, which, by the way, is an important Bible doctrine. There are some preachers today who say that if someone is preaching the gospel, then no one should say anything about anything else they are doing. But that commits the sin of omission of Romans 6, uh, 16, verse 17, which says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So it's a sin to not warn other people of false doctrine. We can both rejoice that the gospel is being preached and also warn about specific aspects of unbiblical ministry. Those don't have to be mutually exclusive. Still, other people say that we should just love everyone like Jesus loved everyone. But loving others is doing what is best for them, and what is best for everyone is doing what is right, and what is right is what is biblical. That's why Jesus says to the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That means the most loving thing I can do for Mark Ward is warn him of what he is doing. But warning him is also loving for other people who might fall into this false doctrine. The most persuasive thing about Mark Ward is not his logical arguments, scholarly research, or biblical explanation. It is his condescending, haughty spirit. People are picking up on this persuasive but unbiblical spirit without looking at the weak reasoning, unbiblical arguments, and unsound doctrine beneath it. And warning others can help those to hear the truth if they are willing to hear a third objection to warning against uh, Mark Ward is that it's a poor use of time. But what could be a better use of time than trying to prevent a pastor from changing a whole separatist uh, Bible preaching church into a disobedient church? A faithful pastor can spend a lifetime trying to build a church only to have a novice um, modern pastor come in and destroy it in a few years. So warning definitely has its place in purpose. In conclusion, Mark Ward justifies lying about who was conducting the survey by saying he needed to lie in order to get accurate information. But this sounds to me like moral relativism and situational ethics. Is this someone you want to trust? Jesus said about false teachers, by their fruits ye shall know them. So let's look at some fruits. 
since Mark Ward is so smart and so intellectual and so highly educated, one would assume he would rush to put all this into practice as a pastor. There are over 100 independent Baptist churches that are looking for a pastor right now, and there are hundreds of other communities just in the United States who need a Bible-preaching church in their town. He could even pastor an ESV-loving Reformed church that would better align with his beliefs. But Ward has decided to pastor none of them. I wonder if this is because it's much harder to work in the trench of the front line than to make media materials from the battlefield's rear. Instead of listening to Ward, listen to those who have built a church for God. They are more qualified than he is. Doctrinal error functions like a leech by slowly sucking the life out of a host while eventually killing it. This is what will eventually happen to churches of pastors who have been infected by Ward's error. Ward talks about friend, uh, false friends in the King James Bible. They are what he describes as words or phrases where, because of language change, they have a, a different meaning than what a modern reader would initially assume. But the greatest false friend is someone who initially appears to want to help you understand the Bible easier, but really undermines your spirit and faith in the inerrancy of Scripture. His greatest false friend is Mark Ward himself. 